Jesus, I just want to thank you for being here with us and for moving among us and that we can feel your presence and that your spirit is here and speaking and moving and helping us see. And I just pray that tonight you'll speak through us, that you will open our eyes to things that uh, we either don't want to see or haven't seen before. And I pray our ears will be open for your truth and also that you will comfort us where something feels uncomfortable or hard. Pray that you'll give us courage and hope that it's worth walking through those things with you. And Father, I'm thankful and I'm grateful that you don't ask us to go through as much as you went through for us. And I just pray that you'll help us remember that as we face the things that are hard, that we'll remember that you've done more and you've endured more and you don't ask us to do even a portion of what you've done. I pray that you'll bless me that I will not get in your way tonight and that we will just have a wonderful time with you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So tonight we are doing the Helmet of Salvation and the Sword of the Spirit. I want to tell you just, just a little thing from this morning. Um, when we finished the second <laughs> session this morning and you guys were in small groups, I went into my room and I was preparing for this session just in case I didn't have time for some reason this evening. And I had gotten, um, because I've been splitting up all the workshop stuff, so the notes for each workshop and the the tools and things that I needed were in these bags. And at some point when I had gone into the room, I'd pulled up the bag for tonight's session and I'd gotten my stuff out and I put it on the table and I prayed and did my thing. And I thought, I'm going to go through my, my notes for tonight of what you're going to see me and Tanya do later. And it's something that God had been challenging me to do openly, to do um, not by rote, right? To respond in truth to things. So I had just written myself just a few notes, just a few reminders in case I forgot certain things. And I look and I, so I'm at my desk and I go to pick up the, the folder that that's in and I cannot find it anywhere. And I kid you not, I had it in my hands five minutes before and I haven't left the room, right? So I'm like, where did that go? Did I? And so I do that thing that you do where you stand up and you turn around. And <laughs> maybe it's, a, I searched. I have a bunch of bags in there because we've done a bunch of these. Could not find it. And the Holy Spirit's in my ear going, I told you you can do this without notes. You can just do this off the cuff. You know the answers to these things. I'm like, yeah, but I get nervous when I have to do it in front of people. It's really nice, really nice just to have a little, just a little thing to fall back on. And he's like, you can do it. It's okay. And I, and I stand there for a second because by this time I've been looking for a couple minutes, can't find anything. And I'm like, okay, so what if I have to do that? I'm like, I could, I could maybe look at Tanya's notes and work off of her. And I thought, no, okay. And I took one last stab at it. I was like, okay, I'm just, I'll just, one more look. And, and Holy Spirit literally went, it's okay. And I was like, okay, okay, yes, okay. I'm just going to trust you. I'm just going to trust you. And I'm just going to do it. And if it stinks, it's on you. <laughs> no, but here's the thing. I was like, okay, and I did that thing that you do where you just go, okay, you know, you just give up, sat down, the folder was right in front of me. I kid you not, the minute, no, 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 this is my heart. All he wanted me to do was be ready to trust, right? He, it wasn't that he wanted me to do it without notes. It was that he, he knew that I was relying on that that I was using that to feel a little bit safer in it, and he wanted me to feel safe with him. So he waited until I had that heart shift, and then he was like, oh, by the way, here's your notes. <laughs> but I'm not joking. When I looked for them, they were like this. They were right here, and I could not see them. 
and I searched that room like three times. Oh. To be fair, it's not a very big room. But I just want to tell you, the reason I bring that up, we were talking a little bit this morning about things that can be hard and why God would let us go through them. And I know this is a very small example. But what I've observed with God is sometimes his desire isn't that he wants to put us through the thing. It's that he wants to see our heart shift into the right place. So some of, like, you, like uh, Abraham and Isaac, right? When he said to him, you need to sacrifice your son. But in the end, he didn't make him do it. I'm not suggesting that you do the thing where you're like, okay, but I don't really have to do it, right? I mean, literally, he waits until your heart really does surrender to him. And then he's like, that's all I wanted. And he, and, he, and he lets, do you know what I mean? And then, and then the relief comes. So I just want to encourage you, if there's stuff on your horizon that feels hard or scary, work towards that place because it's a win-win. If you go, okay, God wants me to surrender this. God wants me to release to him this. And you work through that with him and you get to that place, Either it's going to turn out that he didn't have that in the plan for you anyway. He just wanted your heart to shift. Or you have truly surrendered and given up, and you're going to find out the benefits and the comforts that come with that. So you can't lose when you do it. So I know that that's kind of a silly example, but it was real for me in the moment. <laughs> I wanted those cards. Anyway, I do have them. <laughs> so... What we're talking about first tonight is the helmet of salvation. And I need a volunteer. And I need a volunteer who has not had a prize yet and who is comfortable standing and holding a couple heavy bags for a couple minutes. <laughs> she beat you to it, Dory. <laughs> Come on up. Give Marty a round of applause. Okay, Marty. You are, are, I would like you to stand, I'm so sorry, Julie, I'm going to have to stand in front of you because there's two of us here. Why don't you just stand right here, except let me get my notes because then, oh yes, then I don't forget what I'm doing. Yeah, (laughs) got to have those. If you Uh, get the prize, can I have your sweats? (laughs) (laughs) No? Priorities. (laughs) Okay, I would like to ask you you guys. So the helmet of salvation, right? This is something that we're relying on to stop a head injury, right? Has anybody seen the results of a head injury, serious head injury in a person? Give me, give me, just throw, throw a couple symptoms at me. My grandson just went through one and in for, he's now having seizures. Uh, he was a extremely capable track star at, at 15, can run under a four minute mile. Wow. He's had to give it up because... The doctor said he could only run if he had a partner with him, and the coach said that's not possible. Nobody can keep up with him. So he's had to quit. No. Uh, he's dizzy most of the time. He had to. Mm. He missed almost three months of school. Wow. Paralysis. Paralysis? My brother is 61 in, in the, the final phase at a memory care facility with Alzheimer's and dementia. Wow. From hockey. Have you guys seen how uh, any kind of head injury, it changes your personality, it changes what you're capable of, it can cause headaches, it can cause dizziness or sickness, it can cause so many things. The, the brain, yes, Judy? Short-term memory loss. Yes. yes. And really yes. has that too. Yeah. Not, not being able to remember or hold on to things. Okay. So what, so run with me on this. The metaphor we're going for tonight is... Who's walking around with a spiritual head injury, right? We're going to try and talk about how we get them and why we get them. So I want you guys to tell me what it is that you see either in yourself or in other people, okay? So you don't have to own whatever you offer. The idea is to get as many ideas as we can. The bad things that, uh, excuse me, the things that you rely on to protect you from the bad things that can happen in life or the things you use to escape the bad feelings life can give. Television. Yes. Sorry? Say television. 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 Entertainment. Okay. So I'm going to, just to make this run smoothly, 
Marty, yes. I'm going to tell you that one of the things I see is retail therapy. Okay. So you're going to hold these, right? And you're going to. And I'm going to. Okay. I am. Okay. So entertainment. That was the first one we got. So this is escapism, right? This is doing things. I've got some DVDs here. I think I've got a. Oh, yep. I've got a little game. What else? What else do we use to either escape or to try and protect ourselves? Books. Money. Education. What was the other one? Money. Money and learning or books, education. That's a big one in our culture, isn't it? We think book, that, too. yes, they are. They're heavy. We have heavy loads to carry today. So you want I want things that are unhealthy that we use alcohol. to cope. So money, <laughs> Did you just hear alcohol. Liz? Liz just said cigarettes. Alcohol. Sorry, we're going to do substances of any description that affect your physicality. The, the we have the old wine bottle as our example. Sorry, I just no problem. That would that's covering everything: drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, coffee. Yeah, <laughs> Coffee is the okay addiction, right? We all got it. <laughs> what else? What other things do we use? Your job. Job. Very good. I've got that. Oh, yep. Here, very important papers here. I think you need to hold those in your hand, Marty. Okay. <laughs> All right. I've still got room in this bag. I know. We're, okay. we're, gonna fill we're not it up. done. Don't you worry. Okay. What else? People. People. Relationships. Yes. Relationships. Family, love, friendships. Whatever. We also. I'll, I'll handle this. You just hold them. Oh, I'll all right. make I don't it have work. to help you open the book. Oh, no. I mean the bag. Okay. That's okay. All right. What else? Travel. Travel. Oh, good one. Good one. So I've got the roommate uh, survival kit and just you know sunglasses for vacation what else do we what else do we lean on oh good one you know i actually don't have food we've got a lot of i ate it all, all. <laughs> 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 so i forgot to put the games and the entertainment one so we're going to pretend that this is full of food <laughs> it's, not I, it's, it's not going to fit it's going to have to go in this there. one yes, yes. what else have we got any ideas? Busy. <laughs> sleep. 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 Oh, good one. Sleep. I'm going to throw in with that one medication because this does both. <laughs> uh, we rely on medical things sometimes too much, right? Isolation. What's that? What? Isolation. Isolation. Good one. I have. A single, this is full of Lego, things that we do on our own so that we don't have to deal with, it will go better with, with, with the intricacies and complications of other people, right? Oh, oh cell phones. Oh, mm -hmm. I was going to bring my iPad out here and I forgot. That was, see, you're lucky. You don't have to carry the weight of that <laughs> one. One less, yeah. I, yes. Oh, no, it's fine. I don't want to break your phone. So I'm going to do two last ones because this one isn't very good and I want to explain it to you. Special occasions. Right? We look for events, we look for things that we're going to do, put a lot of time and investment and energy into trying to make them perfect because we think they're going to fill our hearts. The other things is hobbies and crafts, things that we do to kind of keep our minds busy. The stuff we enjoy, they, they feed us a little bit, but we sometimes get too attached, right? So, when we are relying on these things to make us feel better... <laughs> Sorry. That's I'm the, sorry. That's kind of fun. It actually, it's not hurting. So no, I, I'm, I'm not going to actually head injure anybody, but I just want to make the point. Can you protect yourself right now? No. Right? Because there's right. too because much going I, on. Yes. Right? Yeah. So then. I have that. I'd have Did to you put say the bags with the bag? bag. <laughs> That'll be hard oh to do. Gosh. She has to take it away from me for a sure. You ladies are me. <laughs> the helmet of salvation. God tells us that the helmet protects us in some mm -hmm. way from a head injury. Okay. Can you put it on? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> so, <laughs> that was the only story. <laughs> okay, now that I have them all on one side, maybe. Is that the way it goes? Which way does it go? Yeah, this is know. the forward. <laughs> okay. Okay. And then belt in the front. Okay. There we go. Well, there you go now. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So, do you guys see my point? Even when, even when you decide that you're going to rely on God, if you're still holding on to all this stuff, 
it's hard to do, right? It's hard to put stuff in the pen. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for letting me squash your hair. Oh, my hair is already to messy. Warn you. It's not a problem. I forgot. Wait, 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 wait. Put back on. <laughs> All right, you get, to, opportunity. you get to put it back on me. Oh, yay. Yeah. This is just the photo yeah. op I need. Yeah. yeah. Put that under your arm. Oh, right. I still have to have that. Get you got to have that. <laughs> put that one on the left side. <laughs> okay, now you can put him down. Okay. Thank you. You're Bless welcome. you. You can go choose a prize, Marty. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So you guys catch my point, I'm sure. Yes. Oh, let me, and now I've lost my notes again. <laughs> I see a theme this evening. Okay, so what does a spiritual head injury look like? What do you guys think are the symptoms when you are relying on stuff or things or, or parts of your life to keep you safe and protected? We're not trusting God anymore. Lazy, not trusting. What do you think it looks like in your daily life? Depression. Anxiety. Depression. Good one. Anxiety. Anxiety. Yep. Impatience. Impatience. Yep. Impatience. What was that? Right. Prayer is not the first place you go. Complacent. Complacent. Angry. Overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. That's a good one. Try putting the helmet of salvation on with all that stuff in your arms, right? What is giving you guys spiritual head injuries? Is anybody willing to talk about that? <laughs> My job is. Your job? Sorry. Yeah. Why, why do you think that's giving you a head well, injury? Well, I, I know. I don't think it is. I know it is. It's um, I try to turn it over to him every morning in my quiet time. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm at that point where I, I need to be more serious about it and following through with being angry with people that I come in contact with mm. during the day. And um, like, like Tanya said, to be a light at the high school, I, I was not a light on Friday. Mm -hmm. I s snipped at two parents that I probably will have to apologize to, but just being overwhelmed mm -hmm. and thinking, is this madness ever going to stop? Mm -hmm. Who 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 resonates with feeling angry at people because they make life complicated or, you know, whatever the trigger might be? It's very easy for our attention to get focused on the problems other people have and how they are affecting us, right? We all do it. Mm -hmm. Me too. What do you think is getting in the way of you guys taking hold of what God has offered you? The protection that he's offering you. Busyness. Good one. Yes. Busyness. Yeah. Keeping all your time occupied. Self-reliance. Yeah, I was mm -hmm. just going to say not wanting to release control. Yeah, yeah. that's another big one. I know, my own worst enemy. So. Yeah. What are the symptoms when we try to control everything? What does that look like in daily life? Nothing works out well. Hot mess. Yeah. Hot mess. I just get, keep getting the picture of the guy spinning plates on. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just the constant running around. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you're trying to do everything, you don't do anything well. And yes. I'm Amen to that. I oh, I'm very guilty of that. Six things going on at once in any given day. Western culture is particularly uh, invested, not only, uh, and this is some, something that I observe, is that God, the, the further your culture um, claims to know God, but actually doesn't, the more it's self-reliant and like if you look at you know we have all this wealth apparently in our country and we have all of these resources that other people would kill to have people risk their lives to get into this country because their perception 
is that their life will be so much better here. And we are just nose to the grindstone between jobs and kids and kids activities and church stuff. And how many times do you hear somebody at church saying, I'm just so tired. I'm just so busy. I'm so sorry. And I'm really guilty of this. And it's, it's true. I'm so busy. I'm so sorry. I know I was supposed to call you this week and it just, things got away from me and I just couldn't do it. Right. It happens. We get, yeah. But the thing that I think we're losing track of, because sometimes that really does happen. Life throws a curveball at you and you can't do anything about it. And that's okay. But how often have we set ourselves up so that we have filled our lives so completely full that if the slightest thing so much as wobbles, Mm -hmm. everything falls. You know, your house of cards scenario, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And we're so conscious of that. And we're just desperately trying to keep everything balanced because we know as soon as one thing falls, everything is going down. And it's stressful. And then we go, God, why are you doing this to me? Did God, does God instruct you to fill your schedule and your children's and or your children's schedules from dawn to dusk? Absolutely not. Is there any biblical instruction about filling every given moment and making sure that you're doing something? No. What's, what's the godly example of work? The righteous woman. I mean. What's God's, actually God's example? Working six days and resting one. Resting the seventh day. Do you think God needed to rest on the seventh day? No. no. So why did he do it? Because he knew it was important for us. <laughs> and this was, this was Adam and Eve in perfection, remember? When he did this, there was no sin. This was not people who were, were broken and fallen like us. When he put that structure in place, the world was perfect. And that was the example that he gave in perfection. So who is it you think that is driving you to constantly keep yourself occupied? Yourself. What do we get out of it? No, but no, no, because here's the flip side of this. There's always a payoff. There's something that we believe or something that we gain or that we think we gain. That's why we do this. So why do we allow ourselves to get a spiritual head injury? What do we think we're gaining by it? Looking really good to other people. More money. Mm, yep. But I have all the time in the world at this stage mm-hmm. of my life, and I will get everything what I think I need to do done, and I'll sit down and I'll think, you know, I, I've got to just read my Bible, and I need to get into Word. And I'll start in, and I've got my notes, and everything, and the phone will ring. <laughs> or the, someone's at the door. Mm-hmm. Or it, 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 it's just like Satan is just ready to pull me away. Mm-hmm. And then I get frustrated, and then I get busy, and I'm off and doing something else. And... Do, do we notice that we're willing to be pulled away, too? Mm-hmm. How much more important is it for you to answer your phone than to spend time with God? It's not. It isn't. But it is. do you answer your phone mm-hmm. if you're in the middle of, of spending, even, even praying, do you answer your phone? Because I'm guilty of it. I have caught myself in the middle of this wonderful time with God and my phone, it's not even ringing, just dings because somebody sent me something and I don't even think about it. I just turn around and pick it up. My brain is so trained that it, I, I just completely cut off God and switch my attention without even realizing I've done it. Now, the grace of God is that when I realize that and I put it back down, he's like, it's okay, we're good. But the other thing is sometimes he goes, don't pick that up. And I'm like, I'll just be a second. <laughs> you put him on hold. You yeah. Say, God, he's still going to be here. I have to put you on hold. He's still going to be here. Mm-hmm. It's not like he's going anywhere. Right? What I find interesting about that is our conversation at the dinner table. When we were talking about how sometimes people call and you'll be like, oh, I don't want to talk to them. <laughs> I don't want to so talk to them. Why don't we do that when you're sitting down to, right. you know? Exactly. 
So. We we had a conversation at the dinner table yeah. about how the beauty of caller ID yeah. mm-hmm. and how you could choose which phone calls you answered yeah. because you knew who was on the other end of the line. Yeah. And that's a very good observation. I, w- I would put to you that God is always calling, right? And he knows you're limited. He knows you have things that he, to do. He wants you to do things. So all he wants is for you to be in touch. Just stay in touch. What do you think, God? What should I do here? How does this work? What do you want from me in this? I can guarantee you, if you spent one day, that is what praying unceasingly is, by the way. Praying unceasingly is not being on your knees for 24 hours. It's keeping in touch with God while you're living your life. So I'm driving and the guy cuts me off. <laughs> Liz and I talked about this. You got to be careful who you get mad at on the road in a small town. You get DMs at the end of the day going, that was me at the light. Ha <laughs> ha. We were joking. We're like, oh, I knew it was you. It was a joke. Anyway. Um, here's the thing I want you to see and grasp, and I think I might have said this earlier, but I really want you guys to hear this. When you are being tempted, right, when, when, when something's in front of you calling to you, you know that. When you're being accused, when there's something being thrown at you or you're being challenged, you know that. But when you're being deceived, you don't know it. You think you're on the right track. And that's why you turn around and go, God, what are you doing? Because I'm so convinced that I've got this right and I'm headed in the right direction. doesn't even occur to me to ask him if all this stuff I've been doing, he actually wanted me to do. Right? Literally, I have not asked. I've just assumed. And then I get mad at him. How many times? Oh, Lord, how many times do I do things for my family and then get resentful because they didn't appreciate me appropriately? (laughs) Right? Do we? Does everybody understand? Mm -hmm. When the Bible says do things as for the Lord, that's the idea. God, I'm doing this for you. My husband's being an insensitive jerk tonight, and I don't want to make him dinner, but I'm going to do it because I love you and you tell me to do it right? Mm -hmm. It's a totally different heart condition. God does not expect you to pretend to enjoy things that are hard or gross or hurtful. You don't have to go, I love it when they hurt my feelings. (laughs) He doesn't want you to pretend that that's fun and you have joy in it. What he wants you to do is go, you know what, Lord, even though they did that, I know that you want me to show grace so I'm going to do that. Please acknowledge that. <laughs> I, I say to God, I need you to, to like say, yes, I see you. I understand what you're doing. Because I really struggle in those moments to do the thing and not go, did you see me do the thing? I had my husband one time go and he caught himself. He's like, I'm going to clean up the dinner dishes tonight because I want to give you some grace. <laughs> I was like, I feeling the love, yeah, yeah, feeling the love. No, but the thing was, is what was really funny is as soon as it came out of his mouth, he went, oh, and he made a joke. He was like, that was super graceful, wasn't it? You know, so it was actually, it actually ended up being a good thing. But, but we do that, right? We're like, I'm going to love you right now. We, we are really good as women at choosing to serve and then getting bitter about how the service was received. I can tell you, if you choose to serve for God, and you go to him and you say, God, did you see that? He will go, yes, good job, keep going. He will never give you disrespect, insensitivity, lack of understanding, taking advantage. People will. People will without even realizing they're doing it. God will always say, I see you. And good job, girl. Keep going. That's where what I learned. I have to consciously make that decision. Because I can wash the dishes as a service to my family. 
and I can be seething the whole time. But they've got their backs to me. They're doing their thing. They don't have a clue. And I'm sitting there. <laughs> but isn't it though? You sit there and you have the conversation in your mind. Oh, you think you think my casserole was was gummy, do you? you think it's funny to point that out. You think my chicken was stringy, huh? You know? <laughs> But we do that, and then we get mad because we didn't get the response we wanted. Who does that mean we were doing it for? Ourselves. Ourselves. I'm going to serve you so that you'll appreciate me, right? Mm -hmm. And we do that a lot. And I can tell you that will give you a spiritual head injury faster than just about anything else in your life because you are... Declaring yourself the most important person in the room at that moment. Mm. You have the literal creator of the universe watching you every second. And he's not watching you to like, well, you got that part wrong. Make sure we know that. (laughs) He's watching you like, how can I help? What can I do? What do you need? That's how he's watching That's how he's giving. And I'm sitting here going, shut up. I don't want to hear you. Do you see what they're doing to me? Why did you put me in this family? You know what I mean? Like he's he's a giver. God is a giver, not a taker. Anything that he asks for, it's because he knows it's for our good. He literally created life. No one has a better clue about what kind of life will be rewarding and fulfilling for you than the guy who made you. He understands better than you do what will satisfy your heart. His instructions, do not and thou shalt, those are not because he's a power monger who wants to make you miserable. Those are because he knows the opposite of those things will destroy you. And he's trying to give you a heads up. Now, how does he feel when he goes, hey, Amy, you really shouldn't do those things for other people so that they'll admire you because shut up. Don't you see how they're taking advantage of me? No, I'm serious. We do to God the very thing that we're mad at other people doing to us, right? Mm -hmm. He's giving, he's offering, he's advising, he's loving, he's gracious. And we're like, I am not, I do not like the floor in my kitchen. You should have provided me better linoleum. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) sorry, you're right, of course, yes. You should have provided me better vinyl plank. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Here's the thing. The most common lie that I see in the church is the, uh, it, it, that, we, that we try to live ourselves and we actually push each other to as well is the lie that our appearance, the outward looking good, the words that sound good, the stories that we tell that make our families look good, that that being externally good is pleasing to God. We really believe that. And if you don't agree with that statement, talk to God about it. Because I promise you, you're walking into church. I'm walking into church. Everybody's walking into church ready to show how, how we're okay, right? How I'm doing fine. And none of us, I'm not suggesting that you have to walk into church or into work or into your family or anything else, you know, in, in puddles of tears and revealing your deepest secrets every day. I'm saying, let's not pretend. How often has there been terrible things going on in the family, but one good thing happened, and when people ask us about it on Sunday, that's what we talk about. Or when we take a picture and we put it online or we show it to people on our phones, it's only the good stuff that we talk about, right? And then when you bring me all your good pictures and all your good stories, I remember all the bad things that happened in my life and I'm comparing my bad stuff with your good stuff. And you think that you're the only one that's having the bad you're having, so you're not talking about it. And you don't realize that every woman in this room can empathize with you on some level. Every single one. We, we have shared experiences by virtue of being alive. And sure, there's going to be people that you connect with more easily. And there's going to be stories that resonate for you more deeply. 
but there is a human condition and God understands it and he talks to us about it. And if we talk to each other about it, we actually find comfort, right? But we believe this thing. We really believe that the external good is important. And we believe if we don't sustain it, that we're not honoring God somehow. Like you think about it. How many times have you felt sick as a dog and showed up somewhere dressed with makeup, hair done, clothing, right? I feel terrible, but I'm here. Your, your outward appearance says nothing about what's really going on. And we do that with God all the time. Lord, I am going to trust because you tell me to trust. I'm going to do X, Y, Z. And we don't trust it and we don't feel it and we're terrified or we're angry, but we don't say that to God because God might disapprove of that and then he might take away more money. So I'm going to tell him what he wants to hear. How many times are your prayers you telling God what he wants to hear or what you think he wants to hear? Because I can tell you he doesn't want to hear that. He wants to hear what's really going on. He wants to hear that you're angry with him. He wants to hear that you're let down by your family. He wants to hear that things are not going the way you thought they would be going by now. He wants to hear all that. He wants to show you he can comfort you and heal you and guide you and make you feel better in the circumstance that you're in. Your circumstances do not need to change for your life to change dramatically because he can do things in you that have nothing to do with what's going on outside. And when you feel safe in here and you feel loved and appreciated and you have good guidance that you can lean on so the world's not confusing, it's not hard to walk into that scary thing. Or it's a lot easier to navigate that complicated conversation because your best friend is literally inside you and everywhere around you and he will never leave you alone. One thing I want you to understand, we talked about the belt of truth yesterday. One of the truths God gives us, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That means that that celebrity that you see that does all that fundraising or that friend that you know that's forever doing the like volunteer time or whatever, it means nothing to God. We have, have you ever had one of those people you're like, they would make such a good Christian? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, they're workers. <laughs> we look on the outside and we're like, all they need is a change of belief. They'd be perfect. Do you think God sees them that way? Because why are they doing what they're doing? For their own glory. Yeah, they're doing it to be admired or to be liked. I mean, that's the other thing, isn't it? We, we don't talk about that a lot. How often do we walk into the school or the church or the whatever, and the responses that we give are specifically designed to make the other person like us? We're not even considering what's the right thing to say or the best thing to say. We're just, what, what do they want to hear? What will they give me if I tell them the right thing, right? It's a deception that Satan builds from a seed of truth. Because there is value in living well. When you make the right choices because you trust God's judgment, that's a really important distinction. Somebody who doesn't know God can't give money to orphans because they trust God's judgment, right? But I can look at my situation and ask the Holy Spirit what he wants me to do, and he says, that's what I want you to do then I do it, it pleases him. It brings protection, it brings blessing. He tells me that when I serve, he's going to reward me. And I'm gonna, and I'm gonna find the abundance of the life that he has comes back to me tenfold. Now, does that mean he's gonna you know, expand my bank account 10 times? No, it means that what I have will go further and what I need becomes less and I'm more content and I can walk through my day with less and feel like I have more. God's abundance has everything to do with how you feel. We like to say that our emotions are not trustworthy, and that's true. Our emotions can lead us into places that are really unhealthy. But the reality is comfort is real. Healing is real. 
When I do something and God feeds my heart, I walk into the next thing in a better place, like in the, in, in the right kind of way. Do you know what I mean? Seeking God's approval is always the right thing to do, just quietly. But not, God, I'm going to do this, and then you give me more money? That's not going to work. It's not a negotiation. It's what we were talking about this morning. It's about gratitude, recognizing what he gave and giving back, right? So Satan wants you to believe that if you do good, God will be good to you. The truth is God's already good to you, mm -hmm. right? The righteous is delivered from trouble and the wicked walks into it instead. That's in Proverbs 11:8. Psalm 37, 23, and 24 says, the, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they stumble, they will never fall, for the Lord holds them by the hand. But the Bible also says, watch out, don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to the acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward they will ever get. You are exchanging the admiration of man for the admiration of God. That's what he's telling you there. You're going to get your reward. You'll get ad you will get admired. You will. People will applaud you. That's the end of your blessing. You got man's reward. God says, I've got way more for you, right? Proverbs 16, 2 says, all a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. We know from Jeremiah 17, our hearts are very deceitful to us. We can't always measure our own motives, right? We tell ourselves things, but that doesn't mean that's actually what's going on. How often do I go, I'm going to serve the church this week by doing cookie Sunday. And then we tell three of our friends and our husbands how many hours we spent cooking cookies for Cookie Sunday. You have received the reward from man because they will go, oh, thank you so much for doing that. And that's the end of it. And then you're like, oh, nobody appreciates me. I didn't say you, me. I'm, I'm really good at people just don't get me. They just don't understand what I'm doing. The truth is that doing things to earn people's admiration will not protect you because you are motivated by selfishness. So then when you're living in that place, but you can outwardly say, I'm being godly, because on the outside you're making it look like you are, right? Then you get mad because God's not believing the lie. Everybody else believes it. Everybody else thinks you're godly. Everybody else thinks your family's great. Everybody else thinks you're such a great server. And God's like, I'm measuring your heart. He's like, there's a lot of darkness in there. There's a lot of selfish thought. He's not condemning you. He's not rejecting you. He's just recognizing the truth, right? And then we wonder why he's not pouring abundance of whatever it is that we want on us for it. Your own sense of well-being can be an idol to you because you choose it over God. You choose what you think will make you happy over what God tells you will make you happy. If you want a measure of your own motives, if you struggle to self-analyze or you think you're okay, you think you're fine. Oh, I don't do that. I don't do that. I just want to give you this litmus test. For your life. Ask God to put you in a situation that would test your motives. Ask him to put you in a situation where you do something that's hard for you to do. Would you do it if you couldn't tell anyone about it and no one was there to witness it? Would you still do it? If you say, I'm not sure, ask God to put you in that situation and see what happens. Is the urge constantly on the tip of your tongue to tell people what you did? 
Or do you leave little hints around so people might guess and ask you about it? Or do you just, just quietly, just in confidence, I just want to let you know, but don't tell anybody, right? This is just for you. It's really hard sometimes to measure ourselves, right? It's really hard to look inside and know the truth because we have two voices in our ears and sometimes we're listening to the wrong one. I want to encourage you, if you want to be doing it for God and you're not sure that you are, ask him to bring situations in your life where you can serve without telling people that you did it. And take the walk with God and see what he does with that. Because it is, it's hard when you first start, you're like, well, that was fun. It's work. But if you keep doing it and you keep not talking about it and keep not sharing, you find out that God blesses that. He specifically says what you do in secret, he will bless in secret. You will have God's abundance and it will get to where you don't want to tell people because what God gives you is so much better than what people give you, right? How many times have you told people you've done something and they turn around and one-up you? <laughs> you know, and you're like, oh, crud. Here I thought I had this great story. So, the thing that God gives us to help us understand our lives and ourselves and each other is his word. And his word is called the sword of the spirit. And that is the weapon that he gives us, right? We talked about earlier today, how does righteousness save us? How does righteousness protect us? We said it, it invites us into God's family, so his promises are access, accessible to us, and it gives us Christ's authority so that we can actually have some measure of power in this world. It also gives you a weapon. And if you, if you look at this and you go, need to read my Bible. You're literally turning your nose up at the very, the blade God gave you to deal with this world, to deal with all the pain and the hurt and the scared and the whatever. This is a weapon and I want to show you how to use it. So if you get to know it, you can use it too. Tanya is going to help me, isn't she? Uh -huh. Amy, <laughs> you lose your temper when you yell at your husband and your son all the time. That's true. That's why I need Jesus. He tells me that he already paid the price for me so that when I repent and I recognize that I did the wrong thing, he's not going to hold that against me anymore. He says he separates it as far as the east is from the west, so I don't have to carry it anymore. He also says that if I keep forgiving people in my life, he'll keep forgiving me. So that's always going to be accessible to me. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you skip church. Margaret crafts those beautiful emails asking for help. Sometimes she needs you to bake cookies, and you don't respond. That's true. <laughs> but God says that people look at the outside of what you do, they look at the appearance of what you do, that he measures the heart. And he tells me that the things that I do that are done in secret, he sees them, and he'll reward me for them. And he knows and he approves of me even when other people don't. You're a terrible mother. You feed your kid junk food, and you let him play games on the computer and fill his mind with junk and his body. It is true. Sometimes I have to repent for that. Sometimes I get lazy, or sometimes I'm really tired, and I kind of take the shortcut when I know I shouldn't, and I have to ask God to forgive me when I do that. But that's exactly why I need Jesus, because that's exactly what he's paid for. And God also says that if you train a child in the way they should go, that when they're older, they won't depart from it. And God also knows that even though I do stuff like that sometimes, I also actually make an effort to, 
to teach my son and show him who God is and how God will live his life. And I'm a walking testament to the fact that when your parents are faithful and know and love God, even if you go way off track, eventually your heart comes back. Mm -hmm. I know that that scripture is true because I lived it. You're fat. Mm -hmm. You're unattractive. Mm -hmm. Look at your clothes. You haven't looked at a magazine since the 1990s. <laughs> <laughs> you embarrass your son and your husband. That's true. But my son is also learning to see the truth that I already told you. That God doesn't measure the outside appearance. He measures what's inside. And my son is learning to appreciate a woman who has a heart that is for God. And God tells me that what's beautiful to him is a gentle and quiet spirit. Now, to be fair, I'm still working on the quiet part. <laughs> but I'm more, but I'm, that's my goal, and God knows that. And I know, and he reassures me every time I see people look down their nose at me, or every time I see people underestimate me because of how I look, I know that God sees the truth, and he calls me beautiful. You know, they all love you here. But growing up, you weren't so loved. People hated you. They called you gross. You did a very good job of teaching me to hate myself. It's very true. And there are people in this world who still hate me. You almost got me back in 2005. <laughs> I hope you're proud of yourself. I hope but you it. didn't. Because God showed me the truth. He showed me Jesus' promise in Matthew 11 about how he takes the burden. And he says, come to me if you're weary and brokenhearted and I'll give you rest. He tells me that his burden is light. And I thought Jesus was lying because of you. But I've learned that you are. And Jesus also says that, he didn't, that we didn't choose him. He chose us. He chose me. I am special to him. Special? Hmm. That's interesting. Who do you think you are? Look at all the sin in your life. Addicted to cigarettes, alcohol, sex before you were married. You lied all the time. You're not even perfect now. That's true. But I feel like we're kind of a broken record here at this point because Jesus paid for that. And it grieves me that he had to, but he tells me he doesn't, he didn't come here for the healthy people. He came here for the sick ones. And I was sick. And you know what? I'll even give you more. I did that after I was saved. All that stuff, I did it after I knew God, which I think is even worse. But God tells me that I'm a new creation. He keeps putting it aside. He keeps separating it from me. And he says that he, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He loves me, and he promises never to abandon me, and I just have to lean on that because I don't have anything else. You know, you, you talk about him like you know him. <laughs> you, you talk about him like he's just standing there in front of you. There's nothing in front of you. It's just air. You read the pages in the book that you say he wrote. You talk like you know those words. You're crazy. If people knew half the stuff that you believe, they'd commit you. You're lying. You are taking God's word and twisting it. You did a really, really good job of convincing people that God is silent, that you are a liar. Jesus says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. He says, abide in me and I will abide in you. That's living inside you. He says his Holy Spirit will teach us and lead us only into truth, not your lies. He says his word is perfect and inspired. And in Jeremiah 33, he says his Holy Spirit will tell us unsearchable things, things you don't know. 
And in Amos 3, he says, nothing happens on earth except that he tells his prophets about it. I can trust him. He talks to me. I know the voice of my shepherd. <laughs> Never mind. Let me explain this last part to you. Shoot, I don't get to rebuke you. <laughs> so the thing that I found was the final hurdle with God's protection was that when I got through all the accusations and I got through all the shame, I got through all the guilt, we found freedom from all that stuff. Satan's last resort is, okay, fine, then I'm coming after you. I'm going to come at you through your family. I'm going to hurt your kids. Or I'm going to do that. He, he builds fear of himself, right? And that was the last straw. He said to me, well, but I can come at you through your neighbor that doesn't know God. I can attack your family. I can attack your home. I can attack your job. I can attack this, that, and the other. All the things of the world belong to me, blah, 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 blah. Right? The, the, the last hurdle for me in A, understanding God's power in this world, and B, walking into the battle was to say, you have no power. God says no. So I tell you, Satan, there's, there's verses for this, by the way. We heard today the Luke 10 where Jesus says he gives us his authority. We heard Matthew 18 where I talked to you about, or, or did I talk to you guys about what is bound on earth? No. What you bind on earth will be bound in no. heaven? No. no. Okay. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you release on earth will be released in heaven. This is a promise. And heaven, consider heaven to be the spiritual, right? The spiritual realm. With Christ's authority, you can literally tell Satan no. And he has to listen to you. He's not listening to you. It's not your power. It is Christ in you. But that is the victory. When you read in God's word about Christ's victory, that is given to you, that's what he means. Christ faced down the great accuser and released himself and us from sin and death. Satan wants to drag you back into it and you can say no. You don't get to do that. I can say, you don't touch my family. You don't touch my son. You don't touch my husband. You don't touch my friend. And where I see you touching them, I will tell you to leave. You can do that. Just like anything else with God, you have to try it to learn that it works. And sometimes we get it wrong, but God will show us how and why we got it wrong so we don't get it wrong again. This is a really simple thing. Ta <laughs> I was, I was going to literally rebuke Tanya and tell her to shut her mouth and leave. But that's what you, I'm not joking, that's what you can do. When Satan's in your ear doing that, you have the word to refute the lies. But you can, if you believe it, go shut your mouth and get out. Resist the devil and he will flee. It's that simple. If you recognize that it's a lie, why entertain the conversation? Right? Let God comfort you with his word. Get Satan out of the conversation and talk to God instead. Don't give the enemy more than he's due. Don't let him steal time away from the most wonderful relationship you can ever have. Tell him to leave and spend that time with God instead. Sometimes we want to entertain the conversation because we're really scared it's true. Sometimes when Satan says, you're fat and ugly, and your family's ashamed of you. Oh, well, I, I mean, so, meh, maybe, but, you know, God, God says that um, beauty, um, but do you believe? Do you believe? If you don't believe, you need to be in his word. You need to be talking to him and ask him to do the work in you. He can create faith in you. He can literally build your heart in, a, in confidence in him. We're going to break into small groups. I feel like we should clap. Oh. <laughs> no. I do, I no. do. Clap for God. I kid you not. I mean, clap what for you're saying, What you're saying about what God says, that's why I said we should clap. Because it's amazing. It's it amazing. is. He has given us not only more than we deserve, he's given us more than we need. 
How often do we think God, he wants us just working right up to the line and then he'll maybe take the pressure off? No, he gives an abundance. Jesus said, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I come to give life and life abundant. If your life does not feel abundant, Satan is lying to you and you're letting him steal from you. Because the only thing that stands between you and Christ is Satan. Well, and your own choices. <laughs> God loves you enough. I just want to. I just want to point that out. The fact that you have free will is a measure of God's love for you. He knows that love, real love, only happens voluntarily. You cannot force it. You can't program it. You can't intimidate people into it. Real love only only comes by choice. So he gives you a choice. But that means if you choose Satan's way, he will let you. He'll, he'll keep trying to convince you not to, but he leaves the choice to you. So what I want you guys to do is go break into your small groups, talk about some of the verses that we can use to refute the enemy, talk about the promises we can lean on when things are hard, talk about the promises of God's power and how that might look. And if you have a testimony of God's power in your life, share it with the ladies in your group. Let them hear what God has done. I'm just going to pray really fast. Jesus, thank you. I know everything happens in your timing and for your reasons. And I know that there's value in everything that we are thinking and feeling and the things that we have to wrestle with. And I just pray that your Holy Spirit comes right now and infects all of us, that we can listen to you and be comforted by you, that our conversations can be guided by you, that we won't be distracted by our tiredness, that we will be willing to give to you so that we can receive the abundant life that you talk about. And I just pray that you'll guide the rest of this weekend. Help us to know you better, to understand you better, and to love each other better because of it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Small group leaders, are you guys all going to meet where you met this afternoon? Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh.